you're at home. So thank you for staying home. Thank you for listening to science. But because you're listening to science, because you're staying at home, we're doing everything in our power to bring the Science Center to you. And so every Wednesday, you know, for the past couple of weeks and definitely for the foreseeable future, we're bringing in guests. So either live from the floor inside uh, inside Telespark or from our homes. And so today I am thrilled and honored to bring one of my favorite personalities and people, Jay Ingram, into the mix to answer your interesting daily science questions. And so Jay is a good friend as well as massive ambassador for science. We're really lucky to have him. If you don't know, Jay is a former host of Daily Planet on Discovery Channel. He's a ho uh, an author of plenty of really remarkable science books, including a series called The Science of Why. He's also the co-founder of Beakerhead and was named to the Order of Canada. So it's an absolute honor. I'm going to click a little button and we're going to get Jay in here to join us. All right, here he comes. Hey. Hi, how are you? Hi, Jasmine. And hi, everybody. And I'm <laughs> at home, too. And I haven't read all those books that behind me. <laughs> it's okay. It's extra <laughs> extra way for you to look fantastically smart. Um, so Jay, uh, hmm. just um, just to kind of get us started, one of the things that I heard recently was that as we're all at home right now, a lot of us are actually having more vivid dreams. Hmm. And so this made me think of a question that you actually pondered in one of your books. And it's, do we dream in color? Do you know? It's a fantastic question, Jasmine. And uh, I think most people would think, well, of course I dream in color. Like I was dreaming last night, I was in a car and I came up to a traffic light and it changed from red to green and I drove on. But you know, there's some evidence that that may not be true for everyone. And um, a long time ago, 50 or 60 years ago, there were a bunch of surveys done asking people, do you dream in color? or do you dream in black and white? And more people claimed they dreamed in black and white at that point, say in the 1940s, than they did in color. But more recently, uh, it's switched. So now the majority of people say they dream in color. So I have a couple, just a couple of quick things to say about that. First of all, a really interesting theory is that in the, let's say the 1940s, and you looked at, look at the media that people consume movies, black and white, photography, hmm. black and white. There were no color pictures in newspapers. Remember them? Newspapers. <laughs> Everything was black and white. And uh, one researcher suggested, well, that's so people sort of are used to seeing things in black and white as they read and, and look at pictures. Maybe they've just transferred that to their dreams. Uh, but of course, more recently, everything's in color. Everything. So that's another, uh, that's another reason to think that maybe we switched. But I think the most intriguing thing is, um, do we even know? Like, do you, when you have a dream, do you actually consciously think, oh yeah, that, that color, that's teal. <laughs> I would ever dream <laughs> in teal. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, so I've thought about this a lot, and there's actually a third alternative. So you can dream in color. I think I do sometimes. You can dream mm -hmm. in black and white, or actually dream in nothing at all, really. And the comparison here is if you're reading a novel, a, a, a fantastic story about adventure in various parts of the world, do you actually put colors on everything as you're reading? Here's this pirate character. Do you immediately think of him with a big red coat and a, a big black hat? Maybe not. So I would just uh, I would just suggest to people that if you do dream tonight and we're all doing pandemic dreaming, <laughs> uh, try and remember tomorrow morning, or even if you can think of it during the dream, concentrate on color and see what you see. Yeah, so interesting, right? So I yeah. think this is one of the one of the most um, you know. A compelling things about us as humans is that we have the ability to be curious and wonder. And I think it's so interesting to take a moment to pause and ask those questions, reflect on them, but then also seek out the answers. So hello everyone. Thanks again for joining us here at Telespark from home. We're here live with Jay Ingram, of course, and uh, definitely encouraging all of you to submit any of your random questions in science trivia. And Jay's gonna do his best to pull the answers out of, out of his hat. Um, <laughs> 
So, so Amy, kind of just going on the dreams again, Jay, Amy's wondering, why do we remember our dreams? And maybe even the other side of that is like, why don't why we? don't we? Yeah, so that's an excellent question because just yesterday, I was talking to a friend of mine who says he never remembers his dreams. Hmm. Now, my answer to him was that's because, you know, when we sleep, we, have, we go through various stages, quite deep, much more shallow where you can wake up easily. But there's also a stage called rapid eye movement where your eyes are actually, your lids are closed, but your eyes are moving. And um, that's when most humans dream. If you wake up right out of a rapid eye movement stage, right out of a dream, it's pretty likely you'll remember it. Uh, but, you know, we go in and out of these stages so that when you wake up in the morning, it's not very likely you'll remember the dream you had at, say, one o'clock in the morning. Hmm. You might remember the one that you just woke up out of. So why do we remember them? Well, you know, they're, your brain is going crazy in a dream. It's making up stories. They don't make sense. A lot of the mind don't. They don't make sense. But, but they're quite, they can be quite vivid. They can be scary. They can wake you up because they're so scary. And so I think that's why we remember them. I think maybe a more intriguing puzzle is why do not some people not remember them? Now, here's the thing. Hmm. You can try this yourself. Uh, let's say you wake up even in the middle of the night or in the morning and there you do remember a dream. Do your best to try and remember every detail of that dream at that moment because I would guarantee that if, say you got up and you went to brush your teeth or something and you haven't thought about it, it'll be gone. So the memory of dreams seems very fragile and impermanent and kind of uh, temporary. So, you know, and if I can just go on for like 30 seconds Absolutely. more, uh, when we were talking about um, dreaming in color, I said, oh, just pay attention. But that's a special kind of dreaming called lucid dreaming, where you're in the middle of the dream and you suddenly realize you're dreaming. And then some people who can do this can start to control their dream. Hmm. Oh, I was uh, getting beaten in that game. I'm going to win now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't know whether lucid dreams are easier to remember or not, but uh, some people are able to do that. Actually keep dreaming, but realize they're in the middle of a dream. So interesting. Um this makes me think of a handful of questions, but I'm going to take pause on the ones that I have, and I'm going to go to the community here. And Nikki has an interesting one. And actually, funny enough, it's timely because just before we hopped on, uh, Jay was sharing some tales of, of the new family dog. And so Nikki's question is, are there particularly good colors to have for toys for dogs because they see differently? Uh, that's a good question. And I'm hmm. Mind you, I'm obsessed with my dog. I can't swear that I know a lot about dogs in general. But, you know, vision is not their primary sense. Odor is, for mm -hmm. sure. They also have very, very keen hearing. But when you take a dog for a walk, well, at least when I take mine for a walk, 90% <laughs> of the time his nose is on the ground. And, and he's experiencing that, odd, that olfactory smell world that, you know, I can't. So their vision is not um, super strong. And it, I, as I remember, it's not even really good at color differentiation. So um, you'll notice that a lot of good dog tro toys make noise when the dog bites down on it. Squeak. Does yeah. like <laughs> I'm afraid my dog's going to squeak. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I would say, um, well, I, I mean, to be honest, I don't know if there's one particular color, but their color vision is not that great. So I'd be surprised if there was. Mm, the sensory uh, reward to them maybe is more along the, the smell, the sound, the, the feel, perhaps, hey? Yeah, and you know, they love you, but they actually love food. <laughs> yeah, my dog might love uh, when I cook more so than actually being, I might think that's a companionship in the kitchen, but it's actually for other reasons. Uh, now, I've seen a couple questions that have come in around uh, 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 that basically I say if we boil down to them, get to the chicken and the egg question. Is there any way to actually answer what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, um, if you're... <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I'll try and be sciencey here and say if we separate the two and we talk about chickens, well, you know, chickens don't go back hundreds of millions of years. The first birds were probably 150 to 180 million years ago, like well before the dinosaurs died out. They actually are dinosaurs that have survived. Um, and at that point, they laid eggs. Dinosaurs laid eggs too. And eggs go back a long way, but chickens didn't appear, and especially the domestic chicken, until we actually took them in and sheltered them and fed them and took care of them. So technically, I know this is not the answer anybody wants, <laughs> but who, it's my answer. Um, <laughs> technically, eggs, because you know, um, insects lay eggs. So they were doing that 400 million years ago. So eggs came first. And um, I would have to say that if you think of an egg, not as poaching it in a pan, but just it has a little bit of genetics and a little bit of life in it, then I would say definitely that came first. And then all of the variety of living things that we have around us uh, were came after that, after they evolved. Hmm. I have a feeling people aren't going to like that answer. Because, you know, <laughs> that's why you asked They it. wanted to win that trivia at the Zoom dinner party conversation that comes up on Friday night. And you know what? I would just say, oh, the egg for sure, and then change it. <laughs> if you say it with confidence. <laughs> Hopefully. So there's a really fantastic question from, from uh, Florence, who's six years old and, uh, and comes in from uh, from Okotoks and uh, wondering about trees. And so her her curiosity is, how do trees get their annual rings? I might add to that, are they truly annual rings? Are they actually representative of each year? That Sorry, well? are they truly what? Are they, are they truly representative of a year's life of a tree? The rings? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they are. And what's, um, what's particularly fascinating about tree rings is that you can make a record of the Earth's climate from them because you have, let's say you cut down a tree today and it's a very old tree, let's say it's 120 years old, you will have 120 rings in the stump and you can look at them and when the ring is wider, that was a better growing season. So it was probably warmer and this, the growing season lasted longer. Hmm. Now, that's only, let's say, for 120 years, but you, you will be able to find, and people have done this, uh, other old stumps that overlap in time. They, they maybe were cut down 50 years ago, but they started 200 years ago. And you'll be able to sort of take one, take the other, overlap them like this, say all these rings are the same. Oh, but these are earlier rings. And people have been able to go back, say, in Europe, to you know the the uh, 1600s when it was the, called the Little Ice Age, and you can see very narrowly spaced tree rings, which indicate it was really cold then. Um, you can do this, funnily enough, with drilling big cores uh, into the ice of, say, uh, Greenland or Iceland, and um, the depth of the, the or, sorry, the thickness they, they have rings too. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's the thickness of the ring going up the core that uh, tells you how much precipitation there was, how much snow, how much snow got turned into ice, and you can get you can make some guesses about climate there too. So yeah, they're a very very good record of every year. And you know what? This will sound weird to everybody, but um, whales, especially blue whales, have earwax. And not surprisingly, a plug of earwax from a blue whale can be like this long. Right. And they lay their earwax down every year, to, actually seasonally, too. And people have been able to look back at earwax from blue whales from, say, the 1940s and see how stressed their life was, how much time they were able to spend feeding. There was a time after World War II when whale harvest, during and after, when whale harvesting wasn't happening anymore, you can actually see that whales were doing better then. They were oh. feeding more and they were healthier. So this idea of rings, whether it's trees or ice cores or whales, is a fantastic way of going back into the past. Yeah, and it's so uh, 
interesting as well to know that there's a, a number of different ways that we're able to take historical indicators and get data from before we were here or from or from times ago. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, one of the other questions I saw a little bit earlier too, which um, I'm just going to throw at you in in a, in a bit of a reframed way, was um, why do some we're we're going to get into some zoo zoology here? Why do some animals throw their poop? Well, there <laughs> there are many different reasons. Um, my favorite one is um, is a kind of caterpillar that, uh, and you, you may have seen these uh, when the caterpillar hatches out of the egg. It goes onto the surface of a leaf, and then it pulls the, the edge of the leaf over it, just like you pulling the covers over yourself in bed. Yeah. And it actually ties it down with some silk. So it's it's there in the leaf, but it can't be seen because there are lots of birds and other animals that would eat caterpillars. Problem is, uh, there are little wasps that prey on these caterpillars, and they do it not by sight, but by smell. And what they smell is the caterpillar's poop. So hmm. you can't, for reasons of tidiness, as well as not dying by being <laughs> killed by a wasp, you want to move your poop somewhere away. So that, I, can. I can't actually show this very accurately, but at the t back end of the caterpillar, there's a little thing, a device like a catapult. And when it, when it has enough poop ready, it just goes, <laughs> it'll fling it like, you know, a couple of, uh, let's say half a meter or something at most, but at least, uh, you know, a distance like this. And uh, it's, <laughs> it even kind of does it in different directions sometimes. Um, so that's the best, because that's throwing your poop to stay alive. There you um, go. Penguins do it. Uh, their nests are circular and they stand at the edge of the nest pointing the poop out. But that's not nearly as impressive because they don't have like a complicated catapult system. Fair enough. Points to the and, caterpillar and then, on that. Um, uh, hippos, and I've seen this happen at the Calgary Zoo. Um, sometimes when they're pooing, they'll whirl their tail around like this. <laughs> it goes everywhere. The back. <laughs> I don't, you know, and I'm not sure that anybody actually um, knows the reason for doing this because you might think it's, territorial marking like so many animals do with like dogs on hydrants or, um, mm -hmm. you know, many other animals. But the hippos spend most of their time in the water. So if they did this in the water, it would just wash away and not really. So whether they do it on land or not, I don't know. And uh, ch finally, chimpanzees and zoos are known to throw their poop. But I think, honestly, I think they're just having fun. Doing it for the reaction. Don't throw anything. I've had a <laughs> chimpanzee throw rocks at me. So, you well, know. Kiera says, it's all, it's all Kiera, about Kiera. The there we go. Kiera says, uh, maybe that's why they're called caterpillars. Boom, boom, ching. Well done. <laughs> um, so, you know, one thing that we, of course, we all have in common with the animal kingdom is, uh, is the unity around the need for food. And so many of us are getting creative and in, into our kitchens a lot more as we, uh, as we hang out at home. And Ray asks, how do you know if it's safe to eat something past its expiry date? <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, I'm sort of suspicious that that might be my daughter asking that question. But uh, I'll just move on and say that, um, so best before does not, remain, does not mean deadly after, okay? So the best before date is really when the food is, uh, appeals to your taste you know, good taste, good texture, and so on. Uh, you can, in general, eat things after the best before date. Um, I do have a reputation in my family for uh, disregarding best before dates, pretty much. And, <laughs> and, uh, maybe extreme, but here's the thing. Canned goods last a very long time, right? But you do have to be careful. You can't just assume because the can is sealed even though it's two years after the best before date, it's still okay to eat it. You've got to watch for um, a little bit of, if there's rust, which would mean that bacteria might be able to get in, or if there's uh, swelling, because uh, right. if, if it is back contaminated by the bacteria that cause uh, botulism, which mm -hmm. is a deadly disease, uh, they'll produce gas. So if you see any sign, even when you open a can and there's a hiss, 
I wouldn't eat that. But other than that, I'm pretty lax. <laughs> Pretty lax about that. No <laughs> and, and and certainly, like if something is two days beyond its date, uh, I mean, unless it looks like there are gazillions of bacteria on it, I I would eat it. <laughs> there we go. That's a whole other segment. Is would Jay eat it? Is <laughs> we can do. Yeah. Uh, we talked a little bit about dogs earlier. Uh, Mel wants to know if her cat really likes her. Oh, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> does her cat love her or does her cat just tolerate her because she gives her cat everything it wants? And, you, you know, what it highlights is the really pretty extreme difference between cats and dogs. And, uh, you know, most people, most people would say that dogs worship their owners, uh, whereas cats worship themselves. <laughs> um, it's, it's, you know, obviously there are many cats that are quite affectionate and I've owned some. And, um, but they're, they just have a different um, behavioral setup. Their brains are a bit different. Um, it's interesting to look at why or when both dogs and cats became domesticated. So uh, dogs, a long time ago, the present guess is about maybe 30,000 years ago, and they were wolves. Mm -hmm. Wolves would, if you can imagine, hunter-gatherer peoples moving with whatever game they were chasing down before farming. Um, a pack of wolves would find it actually pretty good to hang out, not too close to humans, but close enough that they can pick up scraps. And then you can imagine the bolder or the calmer wolves coming closer and closer. And eventually it serves both. The wolves get some food. Humans uh, get alerted to danger by the presence of the wolves. Farming had to happen before cats came to us because what uh, big um, piles of grain mean are rats and mice. Those are what cats thrive on. And so that's probably how wild cats, both of these probably happened in the Middle East. Uh, that's why wild cats came to live. So, you know, I, I would, uh, I would, uh, console is it mel who asked the question yeah yeah you know what mel just it's up to you, <laughs> you want to that you're, i'm sure that your cat is very fond of you but it's just that you know they don't always demonstrate it in quite the way dogs do maybe that's the, the key difference there we go which is also partly i think why you also get cat people and dog people we might appreciate a particular style of behavior over the other or you know there is data showing that uh, dog people look like their dogs. I'd bring my dog in here to show us, Patty, but I'm not convinced. I don't have nearly as much hair on my face as he does. Uh, but there is, it's very puzzling, but there have been studies where, you, here's how you do this. You have a picture of a dog, and then you have a picture of uh, 10 humans, let's say. And you get people like you and me who don't know the people and don't know the dog, to guess which human is is the owner of this dog and you know it's better than chance that people are able it's not just like flipping a coin people seem to be able to pick the human out now what's really weird about this is that okay if i happen to see a puppy that unconsciously i thought looked like me i might you know i might want to own that puppy but dogs change so much in their appearance and um especially uh, mixed breed dogs, you don't know what they're gonna look like. Um, you know, if you buy, if you uh, acquire a poodle, you kind of know what that poodle is gonna look like when it's an adult, but a mixed breed dog can be, look like anything. So I, this is one of the big mysteries. I don't understand why there is a tendency for people to look like their dogs. How bizarre. Okay, I've seen this question twice and I promise I didn't see it because this is one of the fav one of my favorite projects we've ever been on to research whether or not this was true. I've seen it twice. Britta is the second person to ask. Britta or, uh, asks on behalf of Hazel, who's 10, is Bigfoot real? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, you know, I, no. <laughs> no, Bigfoot is not real. But let, let me just, uh, I'll just take one minute to tell you why the story of Bigfoot, the legend, the saga of Bigfoot is so interesting. And it's interesting because some of the evidence, and there really isn't much, there's 
there are films, videos. Most of them are terrible mm -hmm. and they don't really show you anything. There was one classic film about 50 years ago that, um, that showed a Bigfoot walking through the woods in California. And nobody's, nobody, and I've researched this too much really, um, nobody has ever looked at this and said, here's exactly the explanation. It's easy to say it's a guy in a gorilla suit, except it's not really a gorilla suit. And you can see, because it, it has other features, and you can see that you can actually see leg muscles moving under. Now, if you put on a big, loose, floppy gorilla suit, no one's ever going to see your leg muscles flexing as you walk. So it's it's a bit puzzling. There was a book about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that claimed to have identified the guy in the gorilla suit, but I'm not convinced. The other thing are the footprints. And there's like 100,000 footprints <laughs> that to the trouble to go out to the woods and I guess, you know, like put on big Bigfoot slippers or something and walk through the woods. And I, So in the end, I mean, this is the evidence that, you know, there's no, we would have found one by now. They, they have to be able to breed and maintain a, a living population. But I'm much more interested in the people. In the people. <laughs> take the footprints and make the films. Why are you doing this? <laughs> yeah, what is it about us that need to entertain or trick each other to a certain point for our own amusement? You know, um, there, have been, there have even been footprints where, and like a long set of them, over a thousand prints. So somebody went quite a long way in the woods where one of the, the feet has been <laughs> damaged and, and it's sort of curled on one side. And I just, that boggles my mind. <laughs> you know, the guys are sitting around. You're saying, let's make some Bigfoot uh, prints this weekend. And yeah, today's different. the day. I'm really so committed. Let's not just do regular. <laughs> let's do one that's kind of injured. Yeah, like a little mangled. Lila uh, has a question about uh, about deer um, and is curious why, uh, why they shed their antlers. Yeah, that's an excellent um, reason. Now, why? I, I think the reason is probably, so I'm not, I'm not absolutely sure about this one, um, but you know, in the winter, yeah, I, you know, I might have to uh, think more about this because I was going to say, you know, they're they're generally for display, and display is usually happens around males display and mating time, and that in in the deer that live around here, like in Banff or Jasper, is uh, in the fall. So, uh, you know, you may save a little energy by shedding them in the winter when mating isn't, isn't going on and then regrowing them uh, the next year. But um, that's such a good question. That, and I'm kind of mad because I have a book right over there that would probably have the answer. We'll get back uh, to you, Lila. We'll get back to you. important to admit when you don't know the answer. There we I'm go. Not, <laughs> I'm not, uh, I don't. I'm going to hop over to another one um, uh, about animals as well. Uh, do we know why zebras have stripes? Yeah, so, um, well, we have, we've had lots of suggestions as to why they have stripes. And uh, every, about every five years, it changes. So here are some examples. Uh, camouflage. Now, not camouflage in the sense that you blend into the background, because obviously a black and white striped animal is not going to blend into the background. But... It, it may, on a hot uh, day in Africa, where the air is kind of shimmering because of the heat, those black and white stripe patterns may make it hard for uh, animals like lions to actually focus on them. So that was one reason. And, you know, I guess it's the first and most obvious. Um, but I don't think many people believe that anymore because uh, lions kill plenty of zebras. So they don't seem to be thrown off. Some people have suggested it's a social, like every pattern is a little bit different, so it enables zebras to identify who's who. But lots of animals like horses can do that, and they don't look dramatically, you know, they don't have that dramatic kind of signaling. Uh, one really intriguing idea was that because dark color absorbs heat more than uh, white, Light, it yeah. might set up along the back of the, well, kind of like this, right? You've got a stripe and then black. You, you get different air patterns and it sort of sets up a breeze and cools off the animal. 
but some really smart people did an experiment where they they took big um, barrels, filled them full of water, covered them either with one co a single color coating or a zebra stripe, and then just measured the temperature as they sat in the sun and they were no different. So I don't think that's it. The most interesting to me and one of the most recent is that, and, and a guy figured this out by watching what happened to zebras and horses together on a farm or a, a park in England when, when there were bite, lots of biting flies, like horse flies. And a horse fly would fly in, circle around a horse like this, land, walk two steps or three, bite. If I were the zebra, here's what happens. Horse fly comes in, boing, just bounces off as if the fly didn't even know when to stop. And again, it's this visual thing of black and white stripes that some people think screws up the fly's visual system that connects to its wings and everything else to tell it to slow down, circle, stop, can't do that. Maybe it even thinks the white parts are holes that they can fly right through. But um, they draped horses in zebra jerseys and they didn't get bitten as much. So when I'm going to any place where they're biting flies, I'm going to wear a referee shirt. There we go. Dress like a zebra <laughs> <laughs> on hikes yeah. and camping excursions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Is it true that uh, mosquitoes are attracted um, to more certain people more than they are others? Yeah, and um, it's not completely clear why, but you got to remember, so if a mosquito is some distance from you, it'll probably home in first on the carbon dioxide that's in your breath. Uh, and I, it, they can do that from a pretty great distance, but um, they can't, they don't just use that. As they get closer, they start looking at color. So again, uh, this is the worst color to wear. If you're worried about mosquitoes, this is the best. Um, so color plays a role, but you know, most of us are, I mean, we're all slightly different colors, but when it gets really close to you, then it's picking up other chemicals, sensing chemicals with its antenna that are coming off your skin. And, you know, they're the chemicals that are in sweat or just on the surface, maybe even the bacteria that are all over us uh, create odors that we can't um, really sense, but the mosquito can. Now, hmm. most of us, uh, and this is coming out now, but, you know, the, the so-called microbiome, the bacteria that inhabit your gut and help make you healthy. Everybody has a slightly different uh, a population of bacteria in their intestines. There's no reason to think that we don't have a slightly different, every one of us, slightly different population of bacteria on our skins. And it's the chemicals they release that might make one person very attractive to mosquitoes and one person less attractive. But you know, in the end, um, mosquito repellent is about the only way that you can avoid it. Or <laughs> there you go. Dirt, if a, the answer's right in front of us. <laughs> nobody's going to get bitten by a mosquito. <laughs> um, someone wants to know why it is that planets rotate, and if you can explain that. So uh, the rotation of planets really stems right back to the beginning of, let's take our solar system. So we have eight planets, right? We lost Pluto. There, are, People suspect there's another planet way out there. Yeah. But let's just take, we'll just take the eight. They all uh, revolve around the sun in the same direction. If you spin back time to the time that the solar system started, mm -hmm. which was maybe four and a half, a little bit more than that, four and a half billion years ago, all it was, there were no planets. It was just a vast mess of gas and dust rotating. Now, you're going to say, well, okay, now why was it rotating? And it's just the kind of movement that built up as the universe started and began to coalesce into, into denser areas of material. So if you have the whole disk rotating, then the planets are going to uh, absorb that rotation from there. Now, um, one of them, hope I get this right, I think uh, Uranus or Neptune actually is tilted on its side. Yeah. So it's Very rotating, but it's not really like the rest of us or the, re the rest of the planets. 
but it, it's one of those things that just goes back a very long way. And once the planets, uh, you know, became solid, or in the case of Jupiter and Saturn, gaseous, um, they just maintained that rotation. Hmm. Hmm. You're a bird watcher. What's hmm. your favorite bird? Oh, and why? It's my favorite bird. Well, you know, I'm I'm quite partial to chickadees um, because they're, you know, they they're sort of fun to watch. They're friendly. They will come and feed from your hand. Um, but if I want to be a little um, perverse and different, I would say I have a lot of respect for cowbirds, which most people don't like because cowbirds lay their eggs in other birds' nests. And, you know, people wonder why. It's so obvious, like at this time of year, we already have robins showing up, hoping to find earthworms in Calgary. Oh. Uh, and as I look out the window, there aren't a lot of earthworms that <laughs> out at this time. Um, but they have to, so the, there's two of them, the male and the female. They have to gather, and magpies are doing this now too, gather material for a nest, then make the nest, then lay the eggs, then sit on the eggs for days and days, and then feed the nestlings until, like, it's a huge amount of work. Cowbirds don't have to do, they don't make nests. They just wait till birds like robins have made their nest, and then they go and lay a cowbird egg or two in the nest. But not only that, they act like the mafia. In other words, if you kick their egg out of your nest, they're going to come and destroy all your eggs. And then you're going to have to start over again, build a new nest, lay new eggs. Cowbird will come back. And if you don't accept the cowbird egg this time, they'll do the same thing. They basically threaten you. And so most birds are left with the option of, okay, I'll raise one cowbird nestling, even though I don't want to. They don't think that, but um, just so I can have two of my own. So, you know, it's diabolical and you... <laughs> you have to sort of admire this as a strategy. It seems like a, <laughs> but I don't really they strong know. arm their way through survival, don't they? Yeah, but I but I don't befriend cowboys. <laughs> Amy wants to know if crows actually remember faces. Uh, I'm quite sure that they do because they're pretty amazing overall. Yeah. Crows and especially ravens. Um, but they even have different behaviors. I was just writing about this recently um, uh, over the de uh, dead crow. So if you put out a, uh, two things happen, actually, they will gather around a dead crow mm -hmm. and sort of inspect it and, you know, stay with it for a little while and then eventually uh, leave it. But sometimes if uh, crows are actually in a, in a, let's say there's a pair of crows that have a territory and an experimenter will take a, a de even an imitation dead crow and put it in their territory, they'll attack it. So they clearly know the difference between a live crow and a dead crow and a live, a dead crow and a dead pigeon. They don't care about dead pigeons. So they definitely know crows and um, they definitely recognize people. So in these experiments, if an experimenter comes, puts a fake dead crow on the ground, and then stands, you know, uh, personal isolation distance away. <laughs> um, crows will remember that, what that person was, either what they were wearing or what their face looked like, and will avoid them. Huh. So, yeah, I'm quite sure they, you know, I think we're just scratching the surface in terms of what cows, crows and uh, ravens know. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, to me, they're the most fascinating to watch because I do feel like you actually see their brains spinning. Um, just as we have the last few minutes with you, Jay, uh, Jacqueline asked a really big question. It's something that I wonder, uh, I wonder too. And, you know, she says, I'm going to read her verba verbatim because it's, it's really fantastic. She says, the science is astonishing and that you've been in the science community for quite some time. Um, do you have one thing that maybe stands out as the most unexpected or fascinating thing that you've learned thus far? That's a big one. But, you know, if you're to reflect on your career um, in science and science education, are there particular moments that are really meaningful to you? You know, uh, so there are lots of little things that I find really intriguing. Um, but if you, 
if I was asked, as I just was, uh, what is the thing, I would think the beginning of the universe. Um, because, you know, as far as we can, and that's the thing about this, right, is that you always have to say as far as we know. But as far as we know, the universe in which we live started, um, you know, 13.7 billion years ago out of kind of nothing. And it just exploded outward in, uh, with a speed and power that it really is very difficult uh, to imagine. And I, I, I read a book a long uh, time ago called The First Three Minutes. Hmm. Are you actually, from evidence that you can find today in space, you can tell the story of what happened in the first couple or three minutes of the universe. But, and, and that was a long time ago. That was years and years ago that I read that book. Well, now the, the issue is how many universes are there? Like ours was created at a point in time, but there's nothing to say there weren't already other ones or that there are other ones being created right now. Yeah. And I mean, it's just completely mind boggling to me that we can reach out. I mean, and that's what science really does, right? It, you take the, the sort of obvious surroundings that you're in and what science allows you to do is probe a little bit deeper. What's mm. going on in that tree that allows it to lay down a ring of tissue that somehow relates to how good the weather has been? Um, why did zebras evolve stripes when, you know, some uh, tigers have stripes too. It can't be the same reason. Maybe it's camouflage for the for the um, the tiger, but there are other animals that only have stripes on their rear end. You know who knows. So I, I think that's the thing I love most about science is that it tells wonderful stories about our planet, our solar system, the universe, but they're also. Uh, it's always exploring and finding new answers. And sometimes the old answers aren't adequate. And mm -hmm. so it's kind of a romantic tale, but it's all grounded in, we have to be able to provide evidence to be able to say this. So um, that's why I love it so much. I think that's really beautiful. And I think it's really important you said that. And so, so often we can only say, as far as we know, but there's a next half to that, which is, so let's go discover more. And I think that's what's really remarkable about the science community, community, people like yourselves, everyone that's here participating today is that we, nothing stops us from asking questions. There's no, nothing can stop us from that. And the pursuit of knowledge and to understand our universe um, is what I think is also just really profoundly and beautifully human. So and, thank you. And for you know, sometimes that. the questions are forced on us like right now about coronavirus. Yeah. There are so many we don't know enough about this virus yet, but the worldwide effort mm -hmm. to analyze the virus, figure out its incubation period. If you're, if you've had it, are you immune? Would you have to, you know, where is the vaccine going to come from? It's mm -hmm. absolutely incredible, and it's a serious issue. Uh, I'm not, and I'm, I'm not saying that science has all the answers yet. They, we absolutely don't, but it's the only way we're going to get them. Yeah. No, absolutely. So I join you in a salute to scientists right now and, and thank goodness for them and thank goodness for yeah, you. So, absolutely. One final question before we sign off and wave goodbye to everyone. Uh, Mike wonders, Kirk or Picard? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I could really embarrass myself and say, I never was much of a Star Trek fan. <laughs> but I better not say that because um, I would be Picard. There we go. I join you in that camp. <laughs> well, on that wonderful note, <laughs> whew, done that one. Okay. Thanks, Jay. I really appreciate it. Thanks yeah. everyone for joining us today Bye, and uh, join us next week as well. We're going to continue to do these on Wednesdays and uh, keep on wondering and keep on asking questions and we hope to see you soon. Yeah. Good. Goodbye. Bye-bye.